All right, thanks everyone. Um, so if you don't know, I did do a speech um, for TEDx UWA late last year and the speech was on role models. So I thought I'd bring that to CC. It'll be a little bit different. I don't like to just recite my speech, notwithstanding there's probably intellectual property issues there anyway. So um, I want to tie this into International Women's Day and International Women's Day month that Clifford Chance are doing. And I think it's a really opportune time given role models features um, in the IWD work that we're doing and the theme that we've got going this month. So to start with, I thought of what I'd talk about today is a combination of me, my experiences, so how I became a dual Olympian, how I became a lawyer, and then also how I became a role model. And I think it's always interesting when we start these talks for the audience to think about your role models. So while I'm talking, have a think about who you identify as role models. Do you have role models? If you don't have role models, what's the reason for that? And if you do have role models, why do you have them? Because I'd like to explore the concept today about whether we should have role models and if we do, how we should use them. And the reason is if you think about it, it's always something in the media that piques the public's attention. And we always see stories of people who are identified as role models failing in society, right? So if you think about it, um, there's often stories about football players running amok in their off season. And then there's always stories about retired athletes going off the rails, celebrities ending up in rehab. And these are all people that society put up on a pedestal as role models. So it really begs the question, for me at least, why do we have role models? And if we do have them, how should we best use them? Because realistically, I take the approach that role models are just everyday people achieving extraordinary things. I'll start a bit about me and how I got into um, I guess the position of being a double Olympian and where I ended up. So I started swimming at the age of five um, in Perth. So I was born and bred Perth girl, started in swimming lessons and did the whole going up from minnows to dolphins to sharks or whatever it was and ended up being probably a mixture of stubborn but also talented enough to start winning junior competitions. So I ended up uh, winning WA state championship events to start with progressed onto state teams, went to junior national teams, started making Australian national teams. Um, I won multiple state medals, state records, and won my first state medal around 11. When I was 14, uh, Malaysia found me on their radar, so my parents are both Malaysian and migrated to Australia, and then I was born in Australia. And the Malaysian Sports Association said to me, would I like to represent Malaysia? There's an opportunity to attend the Commonwealth Youth Games next year if you wanted to. Um, at this stage, I was just making junior Australian teams and I thought, weighing up my options, um, I've got an opportunity to go to the Commonwealth Games now. So I took it. And long story short, um, I obviously ended up going to two Olympics representing Malaysia. But interestingly enough, the entire time I was um, living, training, racing in, in Perth and Australia. So it's quite a unique story. And um, as it goes, I decided to stay with Malaysia because I built up quite an allegiance to my family's home nation. And I had quite a bit of a fan base there and I really felt connected because I was the first female uh, to, well actually the first Malaysian athlete to swim in the Olympics in open water swimming. I was the first to do it twice and I was certainly um, from a limited pool of female athletes who had gone to the Olympics for Malaysia, and particularly in a sport like swimming, which isn't very popular in Malaysia, I thought I was really able to use that as a good grounding to um, talk about important issues to me, like gender diversity, even in sport, gender equality, and things like that. So as I said, um, I qualified for the 2012 Olympic Games in London, which is the bottom left-hand picture. Competed in the 10K marathon swim and the selection for those that are interested in sport is such that they only take the top 25 in the world for either for any Olympic Games. So it's a qualification process. You have to do your World Championships, your World Cups, get various points. Only a certain number can go from each country. So People often ask me, was it easier to get in because you're a Malaysian from a smaller country, but at least in open water swimming, it's a world selection event. So they take the top 25 in the world, limited to um, sometimes one, if not two per country. So depending on when you qualify. 
Um, top right was the Rio Olympic Games. So another interesting point from my story is that during the London Olympic Games, I was still studying uh, for a law and commerce degree at the University of Western Australia. So I never undertook part-time study. Uh, I was full-time throughout my entire swimming career, particularly in the lead up to London, which was very stressful. Um, but it, it is what I chose to do ultimately. And the only time I took time off or went to a reduced load was when I was actually at the Olympics or just after because of um, the way semesters crossed over. Come Rio Olympics, I'd qualified for my second Olympics by then. I'd finished my law degree and I was undertaking my College of Law, so my articles program. I was working full time at a WA law firm, which I'd been at for seven years before I left and came to Clifford Chance here. I was working full time. Again, it's not something that many people recognise in athletes. They often think athletes are professional athletes. They get paid by their associations. Um, even Australian athletes, they do get a salary from the government, but it is quite minimum. Um, sorry, it's quite minimal. And certainly swimming for Malaysia, being in Australia, I was getting um, the equivalent of about $50 a week. So it wasn't really, um, it wasn't really a salary, so to speak. So a lot of athletes, when you get to the Olympics, are actually professional, working professionals or working professionals with a side hobby that is sport that they've been fortunate enough to extend out to the Olympics. It's a really interesting dynamic. And I certainly fit in that field. So I was working, um, most people don't know this, I was working corporate law actually, doing very transactional work when I was at Bennett and Co, my old firm. And I'll come to this later, but the reason I talk about this now is that balancing your personal interests and your work life is something that you can do even at the Olympic level and people often say to me how how did you do that and I'm happy to talk about this more um, after the presentation but I think it's really interesting because I'm a pretty good example I think of being able to do more than one thing and so I worked full-time I did um, very transactional work I worked in a practice where it was just myself and a partner floating the corporate company at uh, the corporate practice in the old firm um, I remember distinctly in the lead up to Rio, I floated a company on the ASX two days before I flew out, which was one of the most stressful times in my life. <laughs> and then before the Southeast Asian Games, which was my last um, international race before I retired, I coincidentally floated another company which went up one day before I left. So uh, it's that kind of skill set that you can really um, develop when you're doing more than one thing and you have to because you don't have a choice and you don't have a choice, and this is going to sound a bit weird, but you don't have a choice because you made that choice and that commitment to start with. And that's something I'll talk about later when we come to skill sets and how I like to balance various priorities. So that was me. Um, in a previous life as an Olympian, I haven't swam much since. <laughs> um, nothing to do with Clifford Chance, more just the amount of work I've been doing hasn't really um, allowed me to do that so far. But also I thought I'd take a different route. So once I retired from international swimming, I'd swam all my life. I'd swum full time, uh, 20, 30 hours a week for 20 years by that stage. So um, I decided to do something else. So I, I got admitted um, in WA. I do a lot of public speaking now. So recently I spoke at the Minister for Sport and Recreation in WA. He had a gender diversity panel event. So I spoke at that. Um, I speak at UWA a lot, particularly with their leadership summits and their, um, their guild uh, run events. I won Junior Lawyer of the Year for the Australian Asian um, Association last year. So extending my reach out from the sporting network into the um, professional network is something that I'm looking at doing now. I don't show this, this photo a lot. I wear a lot more clothing now. <laughs> and it's, it's always quite confronting when, you're, um, when your colleagues see you in, in not your work attire. So um, I just want to speak a bit about how I became a role model. So when I made it to the Olympics, with thanks to social media, my profile got catapulted into the world. And people started emailing me, messaging me, Facebooking me, Instagramming me, LinkedIn, like, everything you could imagine, coming up to me in the street whenever I was in Malaysia. And I, I guess, reluctantly became a role model because I always had a, I guess, I wasn't sure how to be a role model. 
and I didn't actually have role models myself because of what I was talking about earlier. How do we use them? Why should we have them? And so I'd have people, uh, a lot of children, email me or message me and say, I want to be just like you. And I really struggled with that because my answer would be, well, you can't be just like me because you aren't me, but I also can't be like you. And putting that aside for a second, the statistics are one in half a million people actually make it to the Olympics. And that doesn't include any factor for um, affluence, which is a major um, contributor to whether you'll be successful in sport. Um, it doesn't factor in what country you come from. It doesn't factor in talent. It doesn't factor in other things like hard work or your work ethic generally, your other skill sets. So the, the statistics of actually being an Olympian are very, very low. And it's a very hard thing to communicate to bright eyed kids who say to you, I want to be just like you. And what's really heartbreaking for me is that when I go to other speeches that Olympians do and they sit in a room full of school kids and these Olympians will say, well, if you want it hard enough and you dream about it as much as you, as much as you can, it will happen. And for me, that's just not the case because I, I didn't dream about being an Olympian and when I wanted to be an Olympian, I certainly didn't dream about it um, enough to get me there. I worked really hard really, really hard. And I think that's something in society now that we really have to talk about with our younger generations who say, well, I saw that on social media, I want to be like them. So going back to these pictures, I was touted as a, a role model for various things. And one of them was, for example, um, women in sport, which is great. And that's something I was passionate about. And then I became a role model for Malaysians in sport. Malaysian women in sport, Malaysian women in swimming. Um, I was also touted as a role model for work-life balance. Meanwhile, in my head, I'm going, well, I actually don't have much work-life balance. I'm always tired. I'm always injured. I get four to five hours sleep a night. How is this actually balanced? I don't feel like I'm a role model for this at all. And then I was also touted as a role model for confidence. And this is a really interesting point because I never felt confident in my entire swimming career. And I'm not even just talking about body confidence. So being a female in a swimsuit obviously is one thing, but being an athlete generally, every time you race, you get ranked. You get a number, you get a time, and you're constantly compared to other people. And if you're not winning, basically you're losing. And if you are winning, there's always a threat that you will lose the next time you race. So it's a very difficult environment I found to be confident in, notwithstanding these photos, which of course make you look like you're fit, fast, sexy and toned, apparently. <laughs> and so it's really interesting because sometimes people say to me, I want to be just like you. And other times they would say to me, you have achieved too much. I, I can't even relate to you. I, I could never do what you've done. And that really struck a chord with me because it's not to me about how much you can be like me. It's actually, for me, how much you can be and achieve within your means and do for yourself to really fulfill and achieve within what you've set up for yourself. Because no one can replicate my story and that's just fact because we all have, we come from different backgrounds, it's just a matter of life. Like I can't replicate anything that any one of you do as well. And just going back to the point on confidence, I think this is a really powerful picture for me because when I finished my first Olympics, I came 16th. And in that 16th placing, I'd beaten previous world champions, previous Olympians, uh, it was only my second year in open water swimming, so before that I was a pool swimmer and I'd done um, a lot of national, international events at a pool level, um, a pool racing level. And so to go into open water was quite a different experience. And I was called a disappointment in the media for not winning a medal for Malaysia at my first Olympics. And initially I found that quite difficult because I was thrilled with my race 
And in fact, I think that year there had only been five Malaysian uh, athletes who'd won a medal at the Olympics. And then when it came to Rio, I finished a mere five places less than what I had finished in London. And, um, you know, I don't talk about this much, but the numbers are what they are. But in terms of the race itself, um, I think I finished within two seconds. So within two seconds, there were six of us. So if I had touched two seconds earlier or half a second earlier, I probably would have finished three places higher. And so not only was then I caught a disappointment, but I was caught a failure uh, because I didn't achieve a higher ranking than what I had in London. So these are the kind of things that you have to deal with when you're a role model. It really made me question, well, on one hand, I'm being told I'm a role model for lots of different things. I'm confident, I'm blah, 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 blah. But actually, I'm also being called a, a disappointment in national media outlets. So it's quite a confronting thing to work through as a role model. And so coming back to the concept of a role model, I'd like to ask you all again, how do you use your role models? Do you have role models? And I think it's interesting for me because people often say, well, who are your role models? And I, I never had one that I really identified with. I probably took certain traits from different people and used those to, um, I guess, inspire me to achieve. And so when we talk about role models, I like to talk about three main things. And one of them is achievement. So I like to tell people that you don't need to achieve what I have, have achieved to be successful, right? So you might have raised a family, bought a house, landed that deal, got a new job, got a promotion, they're all achievements in themselves and I think we really tend to undervalue our achievements when we are constantly comparing them to the achievements of other people. The other thing is success and this is really a big one for me. Success is a matter of perspective and so if you go back to the media article I was talking about where they said to me you were a disappointment, well I actually flipped it around and I said to myself I might be a disappointment to the journalist who wrote this article, but actually I was one of 25 people in the world that got selected on a rankings basis to get into this race to race at all. The fact that I made it to the start line was phenomenal. And actually in Rio, I was really injured at that stage. I knew I probably didn't have too many years of swimming in me. Um, I had hypothermia in that year from various races. It's been a really tough year. So when I came 20 out of 25, yes, I was disappointed that I didn't improve on my previous ranking, but the fact that I even made it to the start line uh, was a really big achievement for me. And it's not something that you can sit down with the journalists and, and talk about when they're interviewing you, because after the race, I was certainly very distraught. Um, actually, I was probably more fatigued to start with. That was probably the primary um, emotion I was feeling. But then after being told, well, are you disappointed? When actually in my head, I was already going, oh, look, that's not that bad. It's not what you wanted, but it wasn't that bad. That's something that is, um, takes a lot of mental training to flip around to see the, I guess, the glass half full approach. And the last thing I'll talk about in terms of how to use role models from my experience is benefit. So we need to think about how we can use role models to benefit ourselves. So for example, you might use my stories of resilience to inspire you to overcome your own challenges. Or you might hear me talk about um, work-life balance and what I've done to balance my various priorities. And then you could use that and inspiration or as an example of how you might want to manage your own time commitments. So I think it's really important when we look at role models to say, well, why, why am I using them and for what purpose? It's not to blindly follow a role model. It's because I can take certain aspects that I relate to and apply them to my life. And I think this is really important because when we look at role models and how we use them, I think we really need to focus on our own successes because we really undervalue, and I said this earlier, I think we really undervalue ourselves when, when we compare our successes to other people. So perhaps our successes should be considered 
in light of our, ourself and what we have done as opposed to comparing them to other people because with that approach there is really only scope to fail. So I think like this poster says and I didn't get this made for this speech, <laughs> um, success starts here. It starts with yourself and when you value yourself and your successes and your achievements I think that's when we really open up the opportunities for ourselves to succeed and achieve things we didn't think we could before. Okay. <laughs>